morning. Welcome to Stonebridge Church Online. Once again, we are so excited to have you tuning in with us from wherever you're at. And wherever you're at this morning, I just ask that you focus your hearts on the Lord. This morning, the songs that we're singing, they're really encouraging us to not fight our own battles, but to put our trust in the Lord. And so maybe you need to do that right now. Maybe you need to tell him what you're putting into his hands. Maybe you need to lift your hands and worship and just let him fight for you, right? His word says, um, in this world, we're going to have trouble. So this shouldn't surprise us, right? But we know that he overcame the world already when he rose from the dead. Amen. Let's worship him this morning. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, you won't breathe. The God I serve knows only how to triumph. In my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory.
this morning would you pray with us father we just thank you right now god in our living rooms wherever we're watching god we want to thank you for what you're doing lord we know that you are alive and active in each one of our hearts and so god i pray that everything that we do we would give glory to you god i I thank you for this worship god that we can sit in our living rooms in our pajamas whatever that looks like god and we can still worship the king of kings and the lord of lords and so god we declare that you are a way maker god that you are powerful in every situation that we face and so i pray your spirit and your power over every single person watching this at home and jesus we thank you for what you're doing we know that you're going to continue to move through the service and so lord we thank you we love you and in your name amen and amen Well, thank you for joining us. We're gonna continue with our service. We just have one quick announcement, uh, but we are gonna have an Easter drive-in service next Sunday, April 12th, at the Woodward football field. We're gonna have that in the parking lot. And so we're asking people to drive uh, and park their cars and join us for a time of worship. We wanna celebrate Easter together as a family. Uh, We're gonna do that the best that we can during this crisis. And so we're gonna invite you at 10 a.m. to go ahead and pull up into the Woodward parking lot at the football field and join us for a time of worship as we celebrate our risen Savior next week because it is Easter and so we want to celebrate that with you and then as we get ready to take up this morning's offering I want to remind us of something uh, in it's Deuteronomy chapter 15 and it's verses 7 through 8 and it says this that if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God is giving you do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them Rather, be open-handed and freely give them whatever they need. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to talk about the difference between being tight-fisted and open-handed. And so verse 10 goes on to actually say this, that give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, talking about being open-handed, that the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and everything you put your hand to. You see this morning that there's a promise that God gives to us in scripture. And it says that when we're open-handed, when we give freely, that that's when he's going to bless everything that you do. He's going to bless everything that you put your hands to is what that verse says. And so we have to understand that there's a requirement of us though, that we don't just get this promise of God, but we have to be willing to be open-handed. And so in times like these during this crisis, I think it's it's easy for us to want to be close-fisted and say, God, I want to hang on to what I have. But what God's asking you this morning to do is to give freely and be open-handed to your neighbors. You see in that scripture, it talks about giving to those who are needy and poor. And that's exactly what our mission is at Stonebridge, that we believe that we exist to bridge the gaps between heaven and humanity and in heaven and humanity and with our friends and our neighbors. And so what we simply want to do is we want to be open-handed with what God is asking of you to give this morning. Because the question, like I said last week, isn't about does God want you to give, it's how much. And so I challenge you, I I want to encourage you to be open-handed, freely giving during this time and trusting that God is going to supply your need, trusting that God is going to be with you during this time of crisis and trusting that when we are open-handed, when we give freely of what we have, that's when we see God bless our work and everything that we put our hand to. And so I wanna pray for you wherever you're at this morning. We have a ton of options to give. We always have, you can text that number as 515-361-3282. And you just simply text the word give to that number. And what you can do is it'll set up a giving for you online. And then we also, you can always go to our website and that's www.stonebridgechurch.net and you can click the giving tab there online. We wanna make sure that you're accessible to give even during this time. And so I wanna pray for you as we get ready to hear the word this morning. 
So Father, we just thank you. God, we know that you are alive and active in our homes and in our living rooms. And God, I pray for every single person, God, that's watching online, that you would keep them safe, that you would help them in this time of crisis. And God, I want to pray right now for a spirit of open-handedness. God, that we would give freely to those around us. Lord, whether we see a burden, God, and we want to help it. And so, God, I pray right now as a church that we would be sacrificial in our giving. And God, that when we do that, when we give freely, that's when we see your blessing take place. That's when we see you bless what we put our hand to and you see us bless in our work. And so, God, I pray right now for a spirit of generosity over every single person watching. God, and that we would get on board with your mission, that we would see lives changed because of our generous giving. That it's not just about giving, but God, it's about seeing your kingdom moved. And so I pray right now that in Woodward and Granger and the surrounding areas, God, that we would see your hand move. And so God, we thank you. We love you. And in your name, amen and amen. Well, good morning, everybody, as you're watching online, maybe you're watching on YouTube, or maybe you're watching on Facebook this morning. We just uh, want to welcome you here uh, to Stonebridge. If you have a Bible uh, this morning, we're going to go ahead and start uh, with the scripture today uh, to Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, and uh, we're just going to read uh, the first two verses uh, in Luke chapter 4, and here's what it says, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. Uh, today we're uh, wrapping up a series that we started uh, five weeks ago, believe it or not, uh, called 40. Uh, when we started this message series uh, for, uh, five weeks ago, had no idea what was uh, going to be happening in our world. Uh, but I really believe that, uh, that this series fits, fits with, what, with what's happening right now for such a time as this. And, and so what we've been doing is, is every single week we've been looking at uh, all the different stories in the Bible that involve the number 40. In fact, here, here's what uh, the number 40 means. The, the number 40 means to test or to trial. Uh, it means a test or it means a trial. And I, and I think that's, that's important. So when you look at the number 40, in fact, uh, if, if you see it through the Scripture, it's all throughout the Scriptures, and if you see something repeated in the Scripture, it, it's usually there for a reason. In fact, that number 40 is found uh, over 140 times. So if you see something over 140 times in the Bible, then that means it's there for a reason. And so every single time that the number 40 is linked in Scripture, it usually means a test or it means a trial. So over the last few weeks, we've been, we've been looking at different stories. We, you know, we talked about Noah when it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Noah was tested uh, with him and his family in the boat as, as the rain and the waters rose. We, we also read about the Israelites and how Moses went up to Mount Sinai and, and Moses disappeared for 40 days and the Israelites were tested as God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And then you even go further to when uh, the Israelites were tested for 40 years in the wilderness. And then last week we talked about Nineveh and how Nineveh was given 40 days to repent. And so Nineveh was tested as well. So we see this over and over and over again that the number 40 represents a test or it represents a trial. Now let's just be honest though this morning. I don't think most people enjoy being tested. In fact, I was just thinking about this when I was a, when I was a kid growing up. I was never really good at taking tests. I was the type of student in school that, that I would study for a test, and yet I would still get a C. Now, I, I had a buddy in school that he was the type of student that he never studied, 
But for some reason, he was able to retain all the information in the class, and, and he would never study for a test, and then he would get a B, and I would get a C. And so I never thought that was really fair. I was never really good at taking tests. Maybe you're like that this morning. Maybe you're not very good at taking tests. I, I read this story uh, this past week about a, a student at Ohio State University. And it was a calculus class. And you can imagine a calculus class. I, I never taken calculus. never was really good at math. But there was a 1,000 students in this classroom, okay? And it was, it was time for the final, but the professor, uh, he, he was kind of one of those professors that he wasn't really well liked. He was kind of an antagonist. And so he had all this pressure. In fact, the, the final test was 90% of your grade. So imagine the pressure of taking this test. And so there was one particular student, he kind of like me, he wasn't very good at taking tests and he felt the pressure of the test. And so it was time to take the test. You had one hour to complete the test. Now, this professor, again, just wasn't a, wasn't a nice guy. And so what he was doing is he was putting the pressure on the students as they're, as they're filling out the answers that he's actually counting down the time that the students had left. So he's like, all right, you got 45 minutes. You have 30 minutes. You know, you have, you have 15 minutes. You have five minutes. And after finally the hour, he said, time's up. Pencil's down. It's time for you to turn in your test. And so he had all of the students come forward to the very front of the room. Imagine a thousand students. And they all came forward and he had them pile their test on his podium. So a thousand tests, right? But this one particular student, like I said, he wasn't very good at taking tests. And so he was still taking the test. And so 15 more minutes went by, 30 more minutes again, 45 minutes. So, and actually, in a, another hour passed. Remember, they're supposed to be done in an hour. So another hour passed, and finally he completed the test. So he picked up the test. He went down to the front. The professor had kind of this smirk on his face, and he said, you're an hour late, son. And he said, I know. I'm just, I, I wanted to make sure I got all these problems right. I want to make sure I, I, I did it correctly. And the professor said, I'm sorry, but you have failed. You have failed the test. You will have to take this class next semester again. And the student kind of looked down, and he looked at that big pile of tests on his podium, and he looked up at the professor, and he said, Professor, do you know my name? The professor kind of looked at him strangely and said, uh, No, I don't know your name. And he said, Good. And he took the test, flipped him up real quick, put his test right in the middle of it, put it down, and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you're like me this morning. Maybe you're not good at taking tests, right? Or maybe you're like that student and you're not good at taking tests, right? Nobody likes taking tests. But here's the thing. Tests are often necessary. Tests are not pleasant, but they are often necessary. Just think of it like this. You know, if, uh, and you, know, if, you, if you don't feel good and you go to the doctor, right? So the doctor takes a test to see what maybe what do you have? Maybe they test your blood or or maybe maybe they 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 test you know they test your heartbeat or your blood pressure. Uh, think about uh, if you have a student, right? I have a I have a 14 year old that's getting his permit. I I'm thankful that there's a test to get your driver's license because I don't want teenagers all over the road. I, I want them to know what a yield sign is, right? I want them to know that. So tests are not fun but they are necessary. Why are they necessary? Well, they're necessary to meet the objectives, right? To meet the objectives of the subject. So, for example, if you go in and, and you're taking a subject, at the end of the subject, the end of the class, the test is going to be about certain objectives to know whether or not you learn, whether or not you meet the standards, if you understand the subject. You say, well, what does this have to do with Luke chapter 4? Well, in Luke chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the desert or into the wilderness. To be what? To be tested. Why did Jesus need to be tested? That's a good question. Well, I want to back up a little bit into Luke chapter 3 because this is important. Before Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tested, the Bible says that Jesus began his ministry after he was baptized in water. Uh, if you know John the Baptist, you know John the Baptist's purpose was to prepare the way of the Messiah. And so when Jesus came to where, to where uh, John was in the Jordan River, John proclaimed, behold, 
This is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then John then baptized Jesus into the Jordan River, and the Bible says that the heavens opened up and God proclaimed, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus and empowered him to begin his ministry. Now, why, why do I say that? Well, you see, what I want you to understand is that God had already affirmed Jesus as his son. Jesus has always been God's son from the very first day. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was God, and the Word was with God. So Jesus is part of the Trinity. So he's always met the objectives, the standards of being the Son of God. But here in Luke chapter 4, what is happening is, is he's going into the wilderness for 40 days to be tested by the devil, not to prove to God, because God already knew that he was, that, that Jesus was his son, but to prove to the world that he was indeed who he said he was, that he would meet the objectives, that he would meet the standards of being the Son of God. So, so for 40 days, the Scripture says that Satan tested Jesus in the wilderness. Now, oftentimes when, when we look at this passage of Scripture, and I, I know I have, and I've, and I've preached this before this way, uh, oftentimes this passage is preached uh, on how to defeat tem temptation. And, and I preached that before, and I think there's some things that we can learn from this passage because every time that Satan came and Satan tempted Jesus, we know that Jesus quoted Scripture. He used the Word of God. And so we can take that principle and know that when Satan tempts us, we have the sword of the Spirit. We have the Word of God to defeat temptation. But this morning, I want to take a broader look at this passage because I think there's actually a, a broader meaning to what's going on here in this, in, in this passage. In fact, uh, all four of the Gospels uh, talk about this. So this is important. All four of the Gospels note the time that Jesus was tested in the wilderness. So what's the broader story? Well, I think the broader story is, is partially this. If you note in, in this passage that it parallels two Old Testament stories, that the temptation of Jesus or the testing of Jesus, uh, I think the better word is testing, that the testing of Jesus parallels two Old Testament stories. The first one is this, if you're taking notes, is Adam and Eve. You see, Adam and Eve was tested by the devil in the garden. If you know that story, you know in the Garden of Eden, what Satan, just like Satan came to Jesus, Satan came to Eve and tempted Eve with the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, And I want you to know, take a note, there are three things here that parallels. If you look at the story of Adam and Eve and the story of Jesus, there are three things that are paralleled in these two stories. The, the three tests that Jesus went through and Adam and Eve. The first test was this, the temptation of the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. Because when Satan came to Adam and Eve, what did he do? He tempted him with the fruit of this tree. And so it, it looked good. It, so for them, it was, it was the flesh, something that their flesh desired. Now, if you look to the story of Jesus, remember Jesus for 40 days, he didn't have anything to eat and he didn't have anything to drink. So his flesh was weak. So what did Satan do? Well, if you go ahead and jump into this, it says this, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. So what does he do? He tempts him with the flesh that to turn the stone into bread. But look how Jesus answers. It says, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. So here's the first thing. Jesus defeated the test of the lust of the flesh. Here's the second one, the lust of the eyes. Go back to the Garden of Eden. What does Satan do? Satan says, says to Eve, says, look at this fruit. And it says that Eve looked at it and it was pleasant to her eyes. It was pleasant to her eyes. Man, that, that fruit sure looks good. Man, it looks juicy. It looks good to bite into the lust of the eyes. Now, what about Jesus? Well, it says in verse 5, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. What did Satan do? Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. He says, look, 
lust of the eyes. Look at all these kingdoms of the world. All you have to do, Jesus, is bow down to me, and all these kingdoms will be yours. The test of the lust of the eyes. Well, look how Jesus replies. Jesus answers, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So once again, Jesus passed the test of the lust of the eyes. But here's the last one this morning. If you take a note, the last one is the pride of life. The pride of life. Because the last temptation that Satan came to Adam and Eve was this. If you partake of this fruit, you will become greater than God. The pride of life. And this is, of course, if you know the story, Adam and Eve partook of that fruit. But what, what about Jesus? Well, if we go down to verse 9, it says, The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And he says, If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So here, Satan takes Jesus to Jerusalem. And he takes them to the point of the temple. He says, Jesus, throw yourself down. And Satan even uses scripture here. That, that's interesting, right? That even Satan knows scripture, but he twists it. And that's what Satan often does. Satan, he knows scripture, but he'll, he'll twist it. And so he says, Jesus, if you, if you throw yourself down from this temple, the angels will catch you. Now, now how, does, how does that apply to the pride of life? Well, here's the reason. You see, Satan took Jesus to the point of the temple in Jerusalem, which was the center place of worship where people gathered to worship God. And so Satan knew that if Jesus would fall down from the temple and the angels caught him and he would land right in the center of the temple, the center of Jerusalem, everyone gathered would see that and they would proclaim him to be the Messiah right then and there. But Jesus knew that wasn't God's plan. See, Jesus knew that God's plan wasn't a plan of shortcuts, that God's plan was to take Jesus eventually to the cross, not a path of glory, but a path of suffering. And so it says in verse 12, Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So three times, you see the parallels this morning? Three times Satan came and tested Adam and Eve. Three times Satan came and tested Jesus. But here's the the difference, friends. You see, Adam and Eve failed, but Jesus overcame. Where Adam and Eve failed, Jesus overcame. And so here's the first parallel. You see, in the New Testament, Jesus is often referred to as the second Adam. He's the second Adam. You see, the first Adam brought sin. The first Adam brought death. But Jesus came And Jesus defeated sin. Jesus Jesus defeated death, right? And so Jesus didn't come to bring death. Jesus came, and he came to bring life. And that is why Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. That's the first story that it parallels. But there's another one. And the second story that it parallels is the story of the Israelites. And when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, Now, Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, but did you know that the Israelites were actually only supposed to be in the wilderness for 40 days as well? That from Egypt to the promised land, it was only a 40-day journey. But because of the Israelites' unbelief and because of their disobedience, the Bible says that they never actually made it to the promised land. And so this is a parallel story here of Jesus in the wilderness because if you notice, each time that Satan comes and he tempts, he tempts Jesus, Jesus quotes scripture, which is true. But every scripture that Jesus quotes is a passage from Deuteronomy. Now, why is that significant? Well, it's significant because Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, is basically a, a book that restates the story of the Jewish people, and it restates the law. The law that they failed to keep, to see the commands that they, that they disobeyed. And so, so what is Jesus doing? You see, again, where Israel failed, Jesus overcame. Where Israel was tested, right, they failed. But when Jesus was tested in the wilderness, he overcame. And that's why in the New Testament, not only is Jesus referred to as the second Adam, but Jesus is also referred to as Israel. He's the new Israel. 
And that's good news for us, friends. Because even in this time that we're living in today, you know, you know, our hope this morning is not in a nation. You see, Israel, that God's, God's initial in the Old Covenant, that Israel was supposed to be a light to the other nations. But Israel failed. They, they failed to keep the commands. They, they disobeyed. And so the whole plan was out of that nation would come the new Israel, which would be Jesus, the Son of God. So we put our faith not in nations. We put our faith not in politics. We put our faith not in man. We put our faith in Jesus because politics will fail, right? Politicians will fail. Nations will fail. But Jesus always passes the tests. Jesus is our overcomer. And, and that's good news for us today. You see, we cannot put our faith today in, in everything that's happening in our world. We, we can't put our faith in man. Because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we don't put our trust, we don't put our hope in man, uh, we put our hope in Jesus. And especially during these unprecedented times, I want to encourage you today to put your hope in Jesus. Now, I just want to conclude in this verse 13 where it says this, that after the 40 days when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. In other words, Satan went running with his tail between his legs. Now, but it also says that he waited until another opportune time. Now, when was that opportune time? The opportune time was the cross. Because if you, if you know the story, you know that, that Jesus eventually was arrested, that Satan was able to use the religious leaders of his day because they felt that Jesus was blaspheming the name of God, that they felt that he was a threat. Satan was able to use the Roman government because the Roman government was afraid that he was, that he was some false messiah and he, he would over, try to overturn the government. And so Satan was manipulating just all these puppets and he's manipulating all of this to happen. And so he thought he had Jesus in his hands when they arrested him, when they whipped him, when they put nails through his hands and through his feet. And when Jesus died on the cross on that Good Friday, Satan thought he had won. But what Satan didn't know was what the enemy meant for evil. God had a plan to turn it for good. And I just want to encourage you with that this morning, that sometimes what the enemy means for evil, God has a plan to turn it for good. And I just, I'm believing that this morning right now as we're in the midst of this crisis, that what the enemy is meaning for evil, that God is going to somehow turn it for good. And Satan thought that he had defeated Jesus. But what Satan didn't know is that when they put Jesus in the tomb, that three days later, right, Easter is coming. It's next week. Amen. Easter is next Sunday. And three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. He overcame sin. He overcame the devil. And when he walked out of the grave, he overcame death. That's the good news of the gospel. But if you know the story, you know that after that, Jesus appeared to his disciples for 40 days. Hey, there's that number 40 again. 40 days he appeared to his followers. And after the 40 days, the Bible says that Jesus ascended back into heaven. Right before the disciples' eyes, he ascended back into heaven and so I want to just take the remainder of our time to ask this question. If, as after Jesus ascended from heaven, where is Jesus right now? And what is Jesus doing? You see, A.W. Tozer said this. He, he says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So I want you to do an exercise right where you're sitting. You're probably sitting in your living room this morning. Uh, I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to picture Jesus. I want you to picture Jesus right now. What, what kind of picture of Jesus do you have right now? Um, you know, I, I was just thinking of this funny, funny story. You know, uh, years ago, we had this, um, this paint that wasn't really a painting. It was a, it was a picture of Jesus's face that was donated one time to the church. And it, uh, it was one of the, you know, kind of profiles of Jesus's face. And uh, it, it, it looked like carpet. And so we, we kind of joked around. We used to call it Carpet Jesus. <laughs> and it's like this big, big 
picture of Jesus' face. And, and uh, my grandmother used to have a picture of Jesus in her bedroom. And it, and it was just the picture of his face. And, and, and I always remember going to grandma's house and seeing that picture. Maybe that's the type of picture that you have of Jesus. But I, for many people, when they close their eyes and they, and they picture Jesus, for many of them, it's Jesus on the cross. And that's a beautiful picture. Uh, you know, a lot of paintings have painted Jesus on the cross. Some churches, if you go into their sanctuaries, there's still, uh, there, there's maybe Jesus on the cross uh, in, their, in their sanctuaries or in their auditoriums. But today, I, I hope that you get a new picture of Jesus today. Because especially when you think about the cross, you see, when we think about the cross, I hope that the picture that you get of the cross is an empty cross. Because the only thing that is left on the cross is your sin. Because your sin was nailed to that cross. So Jesus is no longer on the cross. So where is Jesus? The picture that I hope that you get of Jesus today is that Jesus is at the right hand of God. And the Bible says that he is interceding for you. So the picture that I hope that you get of Jesus this morning is a picture of Jesus praying for you right now. Because that's what Jesus is doing. He's praying for you on your behalf. That's good news. In fact, my last scripture today that I want want you to turn to is Hebrews chapter 4. And Hebrews chapter 4 talks about this idea of what Jesus is doing for us. And it says this, therefore, excuse me, uh, let's start at verse, verse, uh, verse 14. I, I kind of got ahead of myself. Verse 14 says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens. Notice, what, what is he doing? He's gone through the heavens. He's ascended. He has gone through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, led us home firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we have, yet he's without sin. So then let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus has ascended into the heavens And he is now at the right hand of God. And the Bible compares him here in Hebrews as a high priest. As a high priest. And in fact, what is a high priest? Well, a high priest was an advocate between man and God. That was his purpose. Uh, Back in the Old Testament, if you go back to the Israelites and the wandering in the wilderness, uh, God instructed the Israelites to, to construct this tabernacle. And inside the tabernacle, there was the holy place and then the most holy place. But in the holy place, just in the holy place, the the, the priest would go in morning and night and he would light the wick of the incense and the aroma of the incense would rise up to the heavens and it represented the prayers going up to God. The Bible says that Jesus is now our high priest and what is he doing at the right hand of God? He is interceding for us. He is praying for us. So I want to talk real quickly, if you're taking notes, three things that we need to know about the high priest that Hebrews tells us. The first thing is this. is a high priest, Jesus identifies. He identifies. Look at verse, look at verse uh, the 15 there. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but he has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. The first one is Jesus identifies. You see, because Jesus was tested, you go back to the wilderness. He was tested for 40 days. He was tested at the cross. He was tested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because Jesus was tested in every way, the Bible says, he can identify with us. That's good news for us today right now. Jesus understands. Because maybe right now you're in a place where, for example, maybe, maybe you feel isolated. Maybe you're quarantined to your house. Maybe you, you just feel like you can't get out. It, it, it feels like you, you, can't, you can't go to work, you know, like, you, like, you, like you'd like to. And, you, you know, your routine has all been disrupted, and it feels like that you're isolated. You know, Jesus, he felt isolated. 
You think about those 40 days in the wilderness. Jesus was isolated when he was tested by the devil. You think about when Jesus was on the cross. Do you think Jesus felt isolated on the cross? The Bible says that all of his disciples abandoned him. He felt isolated. And so Jesus identifies with our weaknesses. He understands. I, you know, I, I've just been praying this week for the elderly. Um, I've just, that's just been heavy on my heart. Just, you know, those in the nursing homes and those in care facilities that, uh, you know, they, they can't have their family coming and, and visiting them. And, and so, so please be praying for them. And I, and I just, I think about that today that, you know, Jesus identifies, he identifies with isolation. He, he identifies with your emotions. He, he identifies with, with your anger this morning. Some of you are angry about the situation. He understands. He identifies with your trouble. And so when we pray to Jesus, this is the good news, he knows what, what it's like. He knows what it's like to feel. Because not only is he fully God, but he's also fully human. He's not some distant God, a pie in the sky. No, he understands what you're going through. He understands the emotions that you're feeling on the inside. And so when we pray to God and we cry out to God, the good news is this, is that Jesus identifies with what you're feeling. You see, because Jesus was tested, he understands our own testing. I want to say that again. See, because Jesus was tested, he understands our own testing. He identifies. Number two, not only does he identify, but he also qualifies. He qualifies. You see, he qualifies as our high priest. <laughs> Why? Again, if you go back to the story, where Adam and Eve failed, Jesus overcame. Where Israel failed, Jesus overcame. You see, even in the priestly system, even though that was supposed to point to the Son of God, but even that priest that would go into the most holy place and that would offer that sacrifice once a year on the altar, on the mercy seat, he would sacrifice the animal and the blood covering. Even that priest wasn't perfect. But Jesus was without sin. He qualifies you see, it's just like this. If you go to take a, a test, for example, uh, you know, I, I have a couple of friends that are lawyers, and one of the most difficult tests out there is, is the bar. You have to pass the bar. And so after you pass that bar, it means that you, you qualify to be a lawyer, right? But think about the Son of God, Jesus, right? He passed the test. He was without sin, the Bible says, and he qualifies as our high priest. We can go to him because his sacrifice was perfect. He defeated sin, he defeated death, and he defeated the enemy, Satan, on the cross. During the Reformations, uh, the Reformers had three declarations, and I think this is so good. Their declaration was this, no sacrifice but Calvary, no priest but Christ, no confessional but the throne of God. That's, those are some three great confessions, even for the church today, because Jesus qualifies. Amen? No sacrifice but Calvary, no priest but Christ, no confessional but the throne of God. Why? Because Jesus qualifies. So Jesus identifies, he qualifies, and here's the last thing that we read, that Jesus also will supply. In verse 16, this is the promise that let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Because Jesus identifies, because he was without sin, he qualifies, as Hebrews says. And because of that, the scripture says that we can approach him with confidence that we may receive mercy, that we may receive grace and help in our time of need. Listen, Jesus is an advocate that will not bail on you. I know some lawyers, like I said, that when the money runs out, they're going to bail. They're only going to be with you until the money runs out. When the money runs out, they're not, they're not going to advocate for you anymore. The good news is of Jesus is he's not going to bail on you. He's not going to bail on you. Jesus is the high priest, and he's going to continue to pray for you on your behalf until God tells him it's time to go back for your bride. And when that happens, then the church will be, the, the Bible says that the church will be risen and will be gathered together to be with him in the air forever. But until that time, 
Jesus will continue to pray and he will continue to intercede for you. You see, God's promise is we will receive mercy and we will receive grace. Mercy is translated as compassion. Grace can be translated as ability. And I think we need a whole lot of both right now. We need God's compassion. We need God's compassion in our lives and also God's compassion flowing out of us. And we need, we need God's grace. We need his favor. We need his ability in the times that we are living. In fact, it, another translation puts this this way, in our time of need, can also be translated as in our time of affliction. That we will receive compassion and we will receive ability or favor in our time of affliction. That's good news, my friends. And that's what I pray for you this morning. I pray today that wherever you're at today, wherever you're at in your living room this morning, that you would go to Jesus because Jesus is your high priest. Jesus passed the test. Where man failed, Jesus overcame. Jesus holds the credentials as the Son of God. And because of that, he sits at the right hand of the Father. And the promise is, is that you can go to him with boldness, with confidence. So as the worship team comes back up this morning, my, my encouragement to you is this. Go to God with boldness this morning. Wherever you're at today, Wherever you're sitting today, I pray that you would go to God in boldness. I pray that you would go to him with your, with your isolation if you feel isolated. I pray that you would go to him with your loneliness today. Maybe you're lonely because you haven't been in contact with some of your friends or your family members. Go to him today with your fears. You know, I just all the stuff I'm reading, you know, I, I, I try not to spend too much time on Facebook. But right now, it's like, what else do you do, right? And, 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 and as I'm scrolling through Facebook and, and I'm reading the posts sometimes of people or they're responding to all the different press conferences that are going on, it's just, it is so fear-driven. Fear, 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 fear. And as people of God, we have nothing to fear. As people of God, we need to be people of faith, not fear. So today, I, if, if that's you, if you're stuck in a cycle of fear, I want to encourage you today to go to him boldly with your fear. Go to him today with your anxiety. Maybe today, maybe this whole thing has set you back, uh, maybe mentally today. And, and for some of us, I know that depression is a real thing. And, and maybe today that's something that you're struggling with this morning. And, and so today, take, take, take to God your depression. Whatever it is today, you're stressed. Maybe you're just stressed out because, you know, the kids are home and you're thinking, you know, how in the world am I going to teach them at home and there's no more school now until April 30th and, and just, man, the blood pressure is just skyrocketing. Just go to God with your stress. You see, we serve a God who identifies. He identifies with that today. All these things that I've talked with, listen, Jesus identifies with what you're facing today. But the good news is, is not only does I identify, but he qualifies today. We can pray to him in boldness because he is the son of God. He is the second Adam. He is Israel. He is the light of the world. We can go to him because he qualifies as our high priest, as he's at the right hand of the father this morning. And we can go to him, the scripture says, with confidence and with boldness that we may receive mercy, that we may receive grace, that we may receive help in our time of need. I close with this, just this quick thought this morning. You know, I was, I was, as Jesus is our high priest, it doesn't matter where you're at today. All we have to do is call on the name of the Lord. And, you know, so many things that we operate today, you know, there's, there's uh, passcodes. You know, your phone, for example, you know, there's, there's probably a passcode that you have that only, only you can get into your phone. Or, or your computer, you probably have a password on your computer that only you can access your computer. Or some of us, even in our job, you know, we have a, a, a passcode to, to get into our workplace. Or, or a garage, for example. Our garage, you know, there's a passcode, a four-digit code that, that gets us access to our homes. 
And, and each, each of these things that I mentioned this morning, you know, there's, there's precious things. You know, my, my phone has, has pictures on it that are very precious to me. My computer has very important documents on my computer. My home has valuables that I, that I only want certain people in my home, right? But in order to get to those places, I, I have the code. I have the access. I have the, the password in order to get in. To those certain places and as i was just thinking about that this week i just you know what we have the greatest passcode ever and it's five letters and all you need to do is call them out j-e-s-u-s that is the passcode to go to the father because he is your high priest this morning all you have to do my friends is call on his name and the Bible says that you shall receive help, you shall receive grace, you shall receive mercy in your time of affliction. I just believe as a nation, not only personally, but as a nation, we need to boldly come to the Father in our time of affliction. We need to cry out to Him, and we need to call on the name of Jesus, because only Jesus can stop this virus. Only Jesus can heal the nations. And so as a, as a body of Christ, my friends, we need to be calling out, crying out the name of Jesus. Second Chronicles 714 says, if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. What does it say? To seek my face, seek his face, turn from their wicked ways. The promise is then he will hear from heaven and then he will heal their land. We need to be crying out to the name of Jesus. We need to be boldly accessing the throne of God through the name of Jesus because it is the name of Jesus that everything that has a name, including the, including the coronavirus, that everything that has a name is under the name of Jesus. And so we need to be crying out to that name and saying, Jesus, come and Jesus, heal our land so let's just do that right now father in the name of jesus we just come to you god right now right in our living rooms god we cry out to you god we thank you this morning that we serve a god who identifies that you identify with us jesus you identify with all the emotions that we're facing right now as a people whether that's loneliness or isolation or stress or fear or anxiety. God, we thank you, Jesus, that you identify with us, that you understand. But Lord, I thank you, God, that not only you identify, but Jesus, Lord, I thank you that you qualify to be that high priest for us, that God, that you defeated sin, that you were tempted in every way, but God, yet you are without sin. That Jesus, that you who knew no sin, became sin for us. The God that you defeated Satan, you defeated death when you rose from the dead. I thank you, Jesus, that we serve a high priest. And we stand on the word of God that says that we can boldly come to you. And Lord, that we may receive help, that we can receive mercy, that we can receive grace in our time of affliction, in our time of need. So Father, we pray, come, heal our land. Come, Lord, heal our nation. We need your spirit. Lord, we need your spirit to just flow over our nation once again. We cry out to you. We cry out to you right where you're at. Don't be ashamed right where you're at in your living room. Just, just cry out to God. Let's just take a few minutes right where you're at and just cry out to that greatest name above all names, Jesus. Maybe for some of you, that's the only thing that you can just speak right now. And you know what? That's okay. If the only thing that you can say today is Jesus, you have access to God. Just cry out to his name. Jesus, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. We're just going to sing this last song this morning that says, what a beautiful name it is. And I just encourage you today, it doesn't matter where you're at. Listen, the Bible says you don't have to have a, a great voice. Just make a joyful noise. So right now, I want to encourage you to just, just to cry out to God. And let's just, let's just praise him today because what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Because that's what we need in our nation. That's what we need right now. We need the name of Jesus. There is power. There is help in the name of Jesus this morning. So let's just worship him today as a body of Christ.
Father, we just want to give you all the glory, God, and all the praise, because you are the name above every other name. Lord, that your word says that at your name, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that you are Lord. And so, God, we just want to worship you with our lives this morning. 
God, we, we thank you for the work that you're doing all across this place. God, in every single family watching, God, in every single home, Lord, we pray that you would bless them. God, as we surrender our lives to you, God, that's when we would see your kingdom moved in our communities. And so, God, we want to worship you with our lives. God, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And in your name, amen and amen. Well, thank you for joining us online again this week. Man, we hope to see you next week at the Woodward football field. We can't wait to celebrate Easter with you. We love you guys. See you next week.